mess with someone so beloved by people that they call them Saint and Mother Mary, and you might just get some malicious compliance. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, you don't upload until I tell you to upload. Alrighty then, going to try to be as vague as I do still work there. So this happened many, many years ago, and the main character is actually someone else. But most of the staff knew the details of what happened, so first some background. This company has a production process, and there's cycles of this process throughout the shift. At the end of each cycle, you do an upload, not the actual thing. This upload has to be coordinated across multiple work teams, and the person who does it has plenty of other duties. But this is one of the most important ones. Let's call this person's job title Upload Operator, and I'll call the person Rockstar. If this isn't done correctly, it can really slow down or even stop production. So the upload operator is typically pretty tenured and on the trajectory of being promoted. At this company, when we get new members of management, either external or internal from a non-production role, it's not unusual for them to go through a phase I personally like to refer to as knowing just enough to be dangerous, or dangerous phase for short. We had a new manager join the company, let's call them Beavis, and they were assigned a night shift which had become quite reliant on Rockstar in the interim. So Beavis went through a humble phase initially, and everyone really liked them and thought they would do well. Now, Beavis had actually taken a step or two down from their previous role at another company, wanting to do something less stressful. I only mention this because it seemed to fuel the hubris that was ultimately Beavis' demise. So once Beavis reaches the dangerous phase, the change from humble newbie to overconfident jack wagon was jarringly sudden. One evening, Rockstar is doing what they do, and one work team was struggling to be ready for the upload. Now, this happens sometimes, but it's one of the only teams that doesn't necessarily stop production if they don't upload on time. Nevertheless, Beavis freaks out on Rockstar for uploading without them, and as Rockstar is trying to explain that we had to upload, Beavis tells them that they don't upload until Beavis tells them to upload. Period. End of discussion. Do you understand me? Cue malicious compliance. The rest of the shift, Beavis is paying zero attention to the operation. Not sure why they thought that was a good idea after such a contentious exchange, but here we are. All night long, team leads were calling Rockstar asking what was going on and why we hadn't uploaded so we could go on to the next cycle. Rockstar kept saying, I'm waiting for Beavis to let me know when we can upload. And all night long, Beavis was blissfully unaware of the crap storm they had initiated. Towards the end of the night, Beavis finally decides to take a look at some operational dashboards and realizes something is really wrong. Now, this situation might have resulted in Rockstar getting in trouble, possibly even losing their job, if not for the bonehead decision that Beavis makes once they've realized what has happened. They shut down the shift and went home without notifying anyone of the debacle, or telling the night shift employees that they would need to come in the next day to finish the week's work that didn't get done because of him. When the day shift came in and were told they would have to come in on a weekend, there was a lot of backlash. Rockstar was ultimately told, don't ever do that again, but was also immediately promoted to Beavis' position when Beavis was terminated post-haste. I don't blame them for firing Beavis, that's for sure. I'm sure most businesses would try to put the blame on Rockstar, but when Beavis just, like, realized the error and just walked away, that's just inexcusable and makes them the perfect scapegoat. Our next story is One by One. I was recently reminded of this story from a colleague. I work in contracts, meaning my department audits sign documents to make sure everything is legal and compliant with our policies. We have a very old system that we use, think early DOS, like a black screen with white words and you type everything manually, looks like Pong. So typically what happens is I would get a contract for a specific mechanical equipment and I would review to make sure it's possible in a physical sense, and that the finances also make sense. Occasionally, we'll encounter a situation where we need to update our system to allow a contract to go through. This would be if we sold an older equipment that we no longer build but had a few spares lying around, or if a client bought our equipment from a third-party provider but wants us to service it since we're the official company that makes this stuff. It's kind of like a car dealership selling a used car that they don't make anymore. It's still part of their brand, but they might not necessarily have software to support it since it's so outdated. 
trying to explain the best I can. When we have these types of contracts with older equipment, all we have to do is send a note to a person in a specific department and ask her to open the system temporarily to allow these devices to be added and serviced. The way we send this request is that we fill out a form and submit it to this lady. That lady is... something. She's a combination of a power-hungry overlord and a scared, pathetic mouse. It's very interesting to see. I sometimes play a game to bet on which mode she'll respond with. She's very much a bully who cries when she gets called out for being a bully, and then says she's being bullied. Yeah, she's fun. So anyways, one day I received 85 new contracts, same client, all for used equipment that we don't make anymore and haven't for years. Someone found a whole bunch of them for dirt cheap and bought them, and now want us to service them. Cool. Good find, Mr. Client, we'll be happy to help. Typically you submit one request form per device. Filling out the form is a bit of a pain because it's a very manual process and a bit time consuming. I like to be efficient and make life easier, so I did some reviewing and noticed that there really are only like 5 models of machines. 85 different serial numbers, but only 5 types. So I sent off a quick email saying the following. Hi lady, not her name but I'm calling her that here. I have a whole bunch of machines to add to the system, but I don't want to submit 85 different tickets to you. I checked and saw that there's only 5 model types. Can I send you the request in batches by model? Might make our lives a bit easier than going one by one. Now, this lady is notorious for sticking to the rules. I don't usually mind because rules exist for a reason. However, they were also created by people and therefore can be changed by people. In this instance, I was hoping Lady would understand that I'm trying to save us both some time. Nope. Her response was, It is unacceptable that you think you have the right to change the way we do things, especially that you don't even work in my department and have no concept of what it is that I do. We do not work however we want. We have procedures to follow. And if you're unfamiliar with these procedures, then it's clear to me that you need training. A new level of witch has been achieved. You want me to follow procedures? You don't want to understand that I'm trying to help us both? Let's go then. I spent the next three hours creating my emails and ticket requests, but I didn't submit them as I went. Oh no. I waited until I had 85 of them ready to go. Once they were loaded, I spent a hilarious moment clicking send. It was like I was launching little torpedoes every time I clicked send each causing small devastation as they built up in her inbox and overshadow anything else that might have been in her queue. Also, I know she keeps the volume on, so I know she was hearing that darn ding that has traumatized Outlook users everywhere. One by one, 85 different requests were running to her inbox like moths to a flame. I waited for the inevitable tantrum. Hey, I see that you're sending me a bunch of requests, can't you just bunch them together? This is a lot and it's messing up my system now due to the constant influx of emails and tickets. Did I forget to mention that our laptops are also super old? That many emails in one shot most definitely froze her outlook for some time. I replied, oh sorry that you're having a hard time. I was just following procedure as per your request. I already sent them all so nothing I can do. Well, how many requests did you send? 85. What? I then put my status to out to lunch. Have fun lady, I'm getting a sandwich. You gotta love slash hate the knowledge that what OP was trying to say went in one ear and right out the other. Like the actual content of OP's words were completely lost on this lady. She was only focused on the rules and sticking to them. OP was essentially saying, hey, you want the safety harness to go down that ladder with? And she essentially said, no, the rule said you have to climb down one rung at a time. Our next story is, don't mess with our saint and mother, manager Mary. I'm a bartender and this last weekend a guy comes in with his friend and sits at the bar. They order some greasy food and a couple bloodies to combat the hangover. One of them orders something that we're out of, that I didn't realize was 86 when he ordered it. I go to put in their order, realize it, come back and apologize and they're chill about it. But he makes a, I'd like to talk to your manager joke. He's laughing the whole time. I play along and say something dumb like, you know what, we just ran out of those two and they're laughing. But for the rest of their visit, every time I check on them, about three bloodies deep each at this point, 
He won't let it go. I'm still waiting to talk to the manager. At one point, I get worried that he's serious and stare at him and say, do you actually want to speak to a manager because I can get one for you? He stared back at me for a good minute and then laughed and said, no, dude, I'm just messing with you, but still won't let it die. Next time I go over to check on them, a manager is behind the bar getting some stuff for the floor and he says it again. I smile because this manager is the best, great with customers, but always has our back first and foremost. And she isn't up to her neck in BS this particular day and is not having anything. We call her our saint and mother Mary. He asks again. I say, are you sure you want to do that? She's having a pretty bad day. I say, sure, she's right here. Guy looks delighted. Mary looks concerned, comes over and asks him what the problem is. He immediately starts backtracking saying, no, everything's fine. That's just been our joke today. And she is not having any of it. She's like, no, if there's a problem, please let me know. The guy insists there's no problem, he's just messing around. Mary goes off on him. She's like, are you kidding me right now? I don't have the time for this. Saying how disrespectful this is, how there's people who actually need help right now, how they're wasting my time and making me look bad at the bar. Basically saying, why would you pretend about something like that? Either tell me your problem or freak off. The guy immediately regrets his decision. The fear on his face is palpable. I walk up in the aftermath and he says nothing. I say, I told you she's having a bad day. They still tipped me well. You ever have a really bad day and something comes along where you have the green light to flip a witch? And it feels so satisfying because you've had this pent up frustration that you can kind of channel into this moment even though it's unrelated? It's nice to be able to just let that steam off sometimes. Our next story is, want to start production without the letter of credit? This story goes back to the mid-1990s when I was working for a company that made small metering pumps used in the manufacture of many products. The biggest market was in the spinning of synthetic fiber, an industry that literally touches all of us, except nudists and cotton-only folks, every day. In broad terms, the fiber material starts out as a liquid solution. Rayon, viscose fiber, a silix, or a molten polymer. Polyester, nylon, polypropylene, etc. The pumps push the fluid through a spinneret at a very precise flow rate, creating the filament that's made into the fiber. At that time, an average plant would have 75 of the pumps in service. A really big plant would have as many as 1,100. One plant that made cigarette filter material had a couple thousand running at any given time. I was working in the international group when I got a fax, mid-90s remember, from our commissioned agent Joseph in India. He wanted me to call him at home to discuss something. He had a customer that was willing to buy 340 pumps for a fiber plant. Joe asked if we could increase his commission from 10 to 15 percent. It seemed that the end user's purchasing guy wanted to, um, set up his retirement fund. Corporate policy permitted such things if it was local custom and if it was signed off by the GM. It was customary and it was approved. In short order, a $640,000 order rolled in. I'm a hero as it's the biggest order of the year. But the order has the caveat from Joe to not start production until the letter of credit was in hand. This was about 30 weeks before the end of the fiscal year. The pumps had a lead time of 16 weeks, so 14 weeks to get the letter of credit. Piece of cake. Manufacturing and the GM were of course eager to get things going. Shipping the pumps in the current fiscal year would make a pretty good impact on the shipping dollars and would probably be enough to get the GM into bonus territory. So predictably, the GM is pushing the manufacturing folks to get started. The manufacturing folks were on us like hobos on ham sandwiches looking for permission to start manufacturing. First it was weekly, then about 10 weeks out from the drop dead start date it went to twice a week, then to daily. We refused to release the order because no letter of credit was in hand. I was chasing Joe a couple of times a week for the letter of credit. He kept giving reassurances that it was coming. On a trip to India I went with Joe to the customer to see when we could expect the letter of credit. It is coming. Well, okay. So a week before the drop dead date, no letter of credit. I was in my sales manager Tim's office when the head of manufacturing comes waltzing in looking for the release. Tim looked at him and said, our agent says don't start without a letter of credit. We want to trust him, but make them if you want. 
production started the next day. These pumps were mostly standard. Mostly. You see, the pumping bits were mounted on a casting that extended down to a foot that fit between two trunnions. The assembly would be pinched between the trunnions and pivoted over onto a gear on a line shaft. The pump had a gear on its drive shaft. It meshed with the line shaft gear and the pump turned. If this seems weird, it is the finest 1928 technology that allows a failed pump to be isolated and hot swapped. The standard angle on that trunnion was 90 degrees, but not these pumps. These were 105 degrees for some reason. So 340 pumps were made with non-standard ports, and if the letter of credit never came, manufacturing is stuck with 340 oddball pumps, and the letter of credit never came. Year-end hits and the pumps are finished goods and inventory at $640,000. The real problems start when the GM ends up catching heck from the corporate offices in Illinois about the excessive inventory. Crab slides downhill so sales and marketing catches heck too. Joe found out later that the purchasing guy didn't have the authority to buy half a million dollars in pumps. He was just trying to line his pockets. Shocking, right? Where's the malicious compliance? You want us to release the order? We'll release the order. Don't blame us if it goes sideways. Addendum. Four months later, I managed to find another company in another country to buy the pumps, complete with the weird 105-degree trunnion mount. Did I get any credit for that? Of course not. I left the company shortly thereafter, being on the outs with my boss for other reasons and on the outs with manufacturing for letting them make those darn pumps. So, the story was a little hard to follow, but let me backtrack. Is OP essentially saying that company policy was that bribes are okay? Like weird bonuses that have literally nothing to do with any production or effort or goodwill? Just because you wanted to line your pockets? Doing a good job does not mean you should get a raise. At my last company, I was working as a marketing executive. The team included myself and a senior marketing executive. As time went on, I began taking on more responsibilities to the point that I was doing more than the senior in the team, which they admitted. I spoke to my manager about what I need to do to get to a senior position. She gave me goals and a timeline. I hit those targets, and she would move the goalposts. She did this two more times. All the while, I was using my skills to reduce costs and improve the projects I was working on. Specifically, I had started to design everything myself instead of using the expensive design agency, saving the company 45,000 British pounds per year. I finally set another meeting with my manager to discuss a promotion. I showed her how I'd increased the profit margins for all of my projects and all the extra work I'd been doing. Her response was, just because you make nice things and do extra work doesn't entitle you to a promotion. I sat there shocked while she said, but don't worry, you'll get there, then ended the meeting. She had led me on about a promotion for two years. Here's where I started my malicious compliance. I stopped doing anything outside my job description, which included all the design work. Everything went to an agency. The whole team relied on my design work. But when I told them why I was stopping, they were also quite happy to start using the expensive agency. It wasn't until our next quarterly meeting that my manager noticed our profits per project had harshly dropped. When she questioned why we were spending so much, I said, as design is out of my remit, we had to use an agency. She was livid as she had to present the stats to the CEO that week, who ended up yelling at her in front of the directors. She tried to give me an official warning for sabotaging the team, but a talk with HR cleared that away when they realized it wasn't part of my role. She then told me that I had to sign a new contract with an updated job description. I declined that too. Eventually, she asked me what it would take to get me to continue running my projects like I used to, and I mentioned the job title and salary increase. She begrudgingly accepted. I was worried about her being hostile, but then COVID hit and the lady was made redundant. I stayed for a further two years before finally moving to a much better place at the start of this year, and as of today, her LinkedIn continues to show that she's unemployed. I don't know if it's always possible depending on the job, but it seems like if there's somebody trying to hold you down or not entertaining any kind of upwards momentum in the company, whether that's a raise or promotion, 
you should try and find somebody maybe even above that as long as you have the metrics to show that you've been putting in the work and getting results. Somebody above them might have, you know, a little bit more leeway to do something or might realize this person's holding you back. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is Business Class Upgrade If There's Room. I used to work at a regional airline. The jet we used for our flight to the big city had six business class seats. The business class service was really good for a two hour flight. It included a full bar service, a hot meal, warmed bread basket, followed by a trolley with dessert and signature coffee. The good old days. One of our regular travelers was a local business owner who was just a slimy businessman. He had a reputation for making a lot of money from some pretty shady deals over the years. We would roll our eyes when we saw him coming to the check-in counter because he would always name drop and ask for special treatment. He always used the business class check-in line, even though he was usually in economy. He didn't have frequent flyer status, but he was buddies with one of the airline executives and always let us know this fact when he checked in by making sure to tell us that he was good friends with Vice President Karen. He would always ask for free upgrades, extra baggage, not charging a change fee, last minute discounts, etc. If he didn't get what he wanted, he immediately called VP Karen, who would usually then call us and approve whatever it was he wanted. So one day, slimy businessman checks in for his flight to the big city and of course name drops and asks for a free upgrade to business class because I'm friends with the VP Karen and said it would be okay. He was traveling on a discounted ticket that was not eligible for upgrade, even if he did have an upgrade coupon, which he didn't. I informed him that he was not eligible for any upgrade on this ticket and gave him his boarding pass and sent him on his way. Of course, he flips open his cell phone and immediately calls VP Karen. Within two minutes, the phone at the check-in desk rings and it's VP Karen authorizing me to override the policy to upgrade slimy businessman to business class with no upgrade coupon required if there is room. The flight that day wasn't that busy and only one person booked in business class, leaving five open seats. I was really irritated, but I begrudgingly put slimy businessman on the upgrade list anyways. He returned to the check-in counter and picked up his standby boarding card and gave me that smug, told you so look. But then what VP Karen said clicked with me, if there is room. The next passenger I checked in was a super nice lady. Big smile, friendly, please and thank you. Oh, thank you so much for checking my bags to my connecting flight, that's so nice of you. I was taking my time and we were chatting a bit since it wasn't that busy. She was a teacher going on a trip to see her family and it was her first visit with them in over a year and was going to meet her new little nephew for the first time. She was overjoyed just to have the time off to travel. I typed a few things into the computer to make it look like I was checking something about her connecting flights and then said, oh, you've been selected today to receive a free upgrade to business class. She was shocked. I've never flown business class in my life. This is so amazing. At that time, we were rarely questioned if we upgraded someone without a certificate. Over the next 20 minutes, I found excuses to upgrade four other passengers. One who worked for one of our top corporate accounts. One who was legitimately a frequent flyer. Can't remember the other reasons, but by the time I went to board the flight, I had to tell slimy businessman that I was sorry, but business class was full and couldn't offer him an upgrade today. The teacher I upgraded profusely thanked me when she boarded with the rest of the business class passengers. Little did she know that it really made my day also. Honestly, I love this story because I'm sure all of those people had their absolute weeks made when getting a free upgrade to business class. No, don't you worry, you don't have to go sit down on those glorified gray plastic fold-out chairs. Business class for you. Our next story is, just ship the equipment to me. A couple of years ago, I took a fantastic job as an IT manager in a remote role for a healthcare company. It was the best job I'd ever had. Best salary, total freedom, had a wonderful boss who trusted me to do my job. 
I was brought on to create an internal IT team, we'd all been outsource IT, for a company that had 19 offices in 3 US states, and I was given free reign to create the team as I saw fit. I hired a great sysadmin for both our California and Missouri markets, and I served that role for Alabama. The employees loved us. Most tickets were resolved in an hour or two instead of the outsource company taking a day or two and maybe not fixing the issues still. We were saving the company close to half a million dollars per year in outsource cost versus our salaries. The figure does include savings on licensing that the outsource company never cared to audit. It was glorious. But my boss decided to become a stay-at-home dad. I was looking to advance to his position, but our new CEO instead created a new VP of IT position for a guy she had worked with for 7 previous years. Huh. Sadly, the new guy was the micromanager of micromanagers. He had my company credit card closed. I went from a discretionary limit of $10,000 to having to ask his approval on $10 network cables. He put himself on every account removed most of my authority. In effect, I was demoted to senior sysadmin. One day, I visited one of our sites and picked up a bunch of… stuff. Five desktop PCs, we'd moved to laptops only, a carton full of keyboards, mice, cables, weird odds and ends. The idea was that I would take it to one of our other facilities and store it there, save the desktop PCs that I would ship to our outsource partner. Well, I went on vacation only to come home to discover that the previous Friday had been my last day. I was getting two weeks severance and they were eliminating the department entirely. I asked the VP about the equipment, he told me to ship it all to him and he'd dispense of it. Now I assumed he'd want me to ship it to the outsource company, or at least do so with the PCs, but no. The thing is, the VP lives in Colorado, we have no branches there, the outsource partner is in Missouri meaning that no matter what, he'd be at least re-shipping those PCs to Missouri. Oh well. I went to FedEx and carted all the crap in. They offered me various methods, but I told them that it was all going on the company's account to ship it ground per VP, but to do so in whatever method made them the most money. Friends, they spent well over three hours carefully wrapping and padding all of that crap, charged the company several hundred dollars. By my best estimate from previous shipping I'd done with them, it was about triple what it should have been. And of course, VP also had to pay to ship those desktops again, but hey, he told me to do it. Company held my severance until they got the equipment, so I guess I satisfied their requirements. Also, screw that guy, he's a thief and I know it, and I even turned him in but the company did nothing. Yeah, the nepotism was strong in this case. In fact, I'm willing to bet OP trying to turn that guy in may have been a contributing factor to why they got canned. Maybe they realized OP's a little too on to me. Can you, my big VP buddy, do anything about this? Say less. Our next story is, you don't move cars in the wrong spaces? Well, I'll park here then. This happened to me back in early 2015. We just recently made the move to purchase a new EV. At the time, the batteries in the electric vehicles were small compared to today and only had around a 60 to 80 mile range. Well, one of our first larger journeys was to a shopping center about 60 miles away. We chose to go to this shopping center as it was also one of the first places to have electric vehicle charging compared to other shops. And at the time, the charging was still free. So we hoped to get there, get a free charge while shopping and then head home with a full battery. Before we set off, we checked the charger was working through the tap, and once we were happy, we made the journey. When we arrived, we found where the chargers were placed, and ran into our issue. They were working fine, but they were fully blocked by non-electric vehicle cars. The bays were marked, but for whatever reason, people had parked in them. No worries, I thought, and I went into the center to the information desk to ask if they would announce for whoever to pop to their car and move it. They said they didn't do that and wouldn't. I explained I needed to charge to get home and could they please make an exception. They would not, and so I angrily dropped a hint about them clamping the car or leaving a ticket on it. They said they don't do that either. 
In fact, the car park was not monitored at all as it was free to park for the day, so no cameras were needed to monitor the car park, and there were no car park attendants. So you don't do anything about incorrectly parked cars, I asked? The answer I got was a firm no from the information desk person, and they really didn't want to be bothered again. As I got back to the car, I saw there was a pavement to the edge of the chargers. The chargers were situated close to the building, but the pavement was in a place that wouldn't be used much when walking around the car park. It also didn't lead anywhere, and more importantly didn't lead to any disabled or parent parking spots. It was also very wide, which gave me an idea. I then drove to the end of the car park, mounted the wide pavement, made sure there was no one around and slowly drove to the chargers. My cable then reached. I started the charge, locked the car and went shopping. I got back to the car at the end of the day with some form of employee, possibly security but wasn't sure, in front of the center looking perplexed at our car parked on the pavement. I just unlocked the car, pulled the cable away and drove off with a full charge. Safe to say the next time I went there a year later, there were signs on the EV bays stating parking restrictions, there was a fine for non-electric vehicles, and they were marked with more paint to make them extra obvious. Oh, and a couple of bollards at the end of the pavement where I mounted the curb. I love the idea that they added a couple of those bollards because OP wasn't the only one that drove right up onto the pavement like that just so they could get a charge because they didn't care about people parking in the wrong spots. Also, in a year's time, there probably just were more electric vehicles trying to get to those spots, so it goes hand in hand with why they probably enforced it a little bit more. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.